Hi, I'm Marlon Walker and I am live from Pelham's Wasteland and today I have got another session report of the One Ring Second Edition. So we are going to get into that. We're going to talk about the the first session of my One Ring Second Edition campaign. I'm playing every Saturday afternoon. I have five total players and so the expectation is that hopefully at least four of them will be available every session. Um, if we get lower than that, obviously we can figure it out. But uh, so far for the first session, one of the players wasn't able to make it. He had to work, but I had four players. Um, and it was great. It was a it was a really excellent session. We are currently playing through the Tales from the Wilderland um, adventures, which Cubicle Seven put out several of these adventure books um, that are basically a collection of adventures that can either be run separately or can be interconnected. Um, Tales from the Wilderland is the one, it has seven adventures in it, and it is set in the area around kind of Mirkwood Forest, um, and the Vale of Anduin and all of that sort of stuff. So we are playing through that uh, set of adventures, so if you plan to play those adventures, there will be spoilers for the first uh, adventure, excuse me, in that book. Um, the other thing I wanted to say before we get started is I wanted to just start off with a huge thank you to my players who were all just incredible. They were all engaged and interrogating the fiction and uh, familiar with the rules and all the sort of stuff that you like to have from good players. They were, they were terrific. Um, and that's one reason why I think this session of The One Ring honestly it was one of the best sessions that I've ever had the pleasure of running. It was so good, so much fun, and um, a huge part of that is thanks to the players. So I wanted to say thank you to the players. Um, we have we had the, the four player characters were Hallis the Elf, Frerin the Dwarf, Bungo the Hobbit, and Wilder the Ranger of the North. And so the four of them were the, the sort of core party for this one. I think next session, Bungo is going to have to work. So he's not going to be there. But hopefully uh, Merle, the man of Bree, will just sort of step in and take his place. And we'll have the uh, a, a party of four again out of five total players. So... Anyway, the, the first adventure starts off um, near Lake Town. So it starts off, um, in my case, the, the book suggests five years after the events of The Hobbit. Um, I set it to four years after the events of The Hobbit to have a little more wiggle room to work in some Darkening of Mirkwood stuff into the campaign. Um, but anyway, four years after the events of The Hobbit, the death of Smog the Golden, and the Battle of the Five Armies, Lake Town has been rebuilt on the Long Lake on a new site. The players start off in Lake Town and basically are taking a sort of day trip to um, look at the ruins of old Lake Town and the bones of Smog the Golden, the dragon, and um, maybe find, you know, washed up treasure from Smog's, correct? Right? Smog was covered in gold and gems on his underbelly. So the story goes that sometimes gems wash up on the lake shore near that part of the lake. Um, so they're sort of having a nice day, hanging out maybe an hour away from Lake Town. Um, and then they hear a cry for help. And they sort of look around. We'd get our first dice rolling going. They roll awareness, and the ranger is the only one who succeeds. And he notices that there's a boy running to them towards the uh, the sort of rushes and, and reeds and stuff at the edge of the lake um, who's crying for help. And this boy, he kind of rushes up and he cries, Help, help! They're going to kill my father! You have to help him! And it turns out that this boy is the son of a merchant whose guards have turned on him. Um, and so the players uh, basically hear that the, the, the merchant is in trouble. The boy's name is Belgo and the merchant, his father's name is Baldor. Um, and so they, uh, 
they don't have that information yet, but they decide to go and kind of see what's going on. They um, run after the boy and get to this sort of clearing where they find a sort of older kind of pudgy man holding a um, like a, a walking stick, like a club trying to fend off three of these sort of thugs that he's hired as his guards. The thugs sort of say, hey, this is our business. Leave us alone. Um, and the dwarf speaks up and says, you know, if you have a problem with the merchant, you can take him to the law court, but you're not going to do anything to him while we're here. Um, and I say, well, that sounds like an awe check. So he rolls awe, gets a great success, meaning that he rolls not just a success as in rolling higher than the target number, but also rolls a six on his um, six sided on one of his six sided dice. And basically the thugs drop their weapons and turn and run off. Um, they're so intimidated by the dwarf that they um, rush off and that's that. So Baldur the merchant starts thanking the players. He's sort of saying, oh, thank you, thank you so much. I don't know what we'd do. He kind of comforts Belgo. And then he sort of says, well, now I'm not sure what I'm going to do because I hired these guards to help protect my caravan as we go through Mirkwood because um, I'm planning on basically going to the Elf King's Halls, Thranduil's Halls, and then along the Elf Path through Mirkwood um, to take kind of goods, trade goods from the city of Dale and Lake Town to the Vale of Anduin to sell them. And um, the player characters are sort of listening to this and Baldur says, ah, I've got an idea. You guys are clearly tougher than the guards I hired before. Why don't I hire you guys to be my guards on the trip? And the player characters are sort of thinking about it and Baldur says, I'll pay you double what I was paying them and um, I've already got uh, provisions for the trip and everything so we can leave right now. It's going to be good. And the player characters sort of decide, yeah, you know what, they're, they're in for adventure. And that's basically how the adventure starts in the book. Um, Baldur the merchant gets rescued by the players and then hires them to uh, go and be his guards. So... Then they uh, ask Baldur, well, what's the next step? And Baldur says, oh, we're just going to walk along, you know, maybe a couple hours to get uh, a little upriver. And then we're going to wait for my elf friends to come pick us up. And so they say, okay, we'll do that. They talked to Baldur a little bit on the way. Um, the, there was one thing that I think worked really well, which is um, Wilder the Ranger was asking Baldor about his travel history, and Baldor hasn't been traveling recently, so he said that, but Baldor kind of explained a little bit of his kind of backstory, essentially, while... Um, Wilder was asking him, which I think was really good. I think it was a good way to get that information into the player's hands without feeling like I was kind of feeding it to them, right? Baldor was sort of willing to explain that he hasn't been traveling because um, he was a successful merchant in Lake Town and then basically lost his business and his wife when the dragon attacked four years ago. And now this is his first kind of trip out to try to make his fortune again. Um, and, and it was really good. It was a good way to um, get the players some information that becomes relevant later in the adventure without kind of just feeding it to them because they need it. Um, so that was really good. And it was, it was great that um, sh the player character, Wilder's player, Wilder's player was interested in... Um, interrogating the fiction like that, kind of talking to Baldor and asking him about some stuff so that I could, right, he kind of set it up and then I was able to capitalize on it um, with stuff that was useful, going to be useful to them later in the adventure. So they get to a sort of wide spot in the river. They sort of sit down, have a meal, and wait for nightfall. And um, in the twilight that night, come out of the mist three elves piloting three rafts and these elves come up they um the party gets on the rafts baldor and Beldo, belgo get on the rafts and then the ponies are coaxed onto the rafts the elves have to speak something in elvish to the the ponies to get them to come but they're willing after saying that they're willing to to come on to the rafts and so there are four ponies with um the party so Anyway, um, 
they basically get on the rafts and they um, start heading up river. And it's going to take them a couple days to travel up river to get to the Elf King's halls. They end up talking to one of the the elf rafters. Um, I can't remember the name that I gave him, but I randomly generated a name. Um, and um, basically, that's another thing that I think works well is that now we've got sort of a, a Mirkwood Elf NPC who can be used to kind of um, suggest the continuity of the world now, right? Because there's a couple of other adventures that have some level of interaction with the Mirkwood Elves. So it's a... Um, there's a measure of like, you know, if they ask about their buddy, this elf, then I can say, yeah, the, this character knows about um, him and, and can tell you about him and that sort of thing. And basically to suggest the sort of continuity of the world that they um, they could meet him again or they could ask about him or they could hear about his exploits, that sort of thing. Um Anyway, having named NPCs, I feel like is uh, and and putting that in your notes and using them for later is always a good thing for um, that kind of world continuity, as opposed to just having kind of unnamed NPCs. You know, the shopkeeper, that sort of thing. Um, so I'm I'm trying to get better about because my. My um, inclination sometimes is to just, you know, it doesn't matter what the NPC's name is, just pay them their gold, basically. Um, but I'm trying to get better about um, putting in that flavor into the, uh, the world so that the players can engage with it. Anyway, um, they find out a little bit of information from him. They get to the Elf King's halls and they meet the master of the cellars, who it turns out does not like dwarves. Unsurprising, he's a Mirkwood elf. And he does not like hobbits because he was the master of the cellars when Bilbo came through and um, found out about what Bilbo did and so holds a bit of a grudge. So he basically tells them, um, because you've got, you know, the elf, Hallis, um, he's okay, and a wilder the ranger is okay, but the dwarf and the hobbit they have to stay in the 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 bad rooms. The they're gonna put him up, but they're not gonna feed him very good food, and they're gonna stay kind of underground in the sort of cave section um, in the bad rooms. And this was this was a place where the players really stepped up. Hallis the elf basically stepped up and said, "Nope, we're not going to do that." Um, there wasn't any kind of mechanical difference to the bad rooms versus the good rooms. It was totally a flavor thing. But Hallis the elf said, "You know what? I'm going to stick up for my friends, and um, I'm gonna I'm gonna convince I'm gonna help us convince." Uh, Lindar, the master of the cellars, that he needs to stick up for them too, and that we should be in the good rooms, basically, above ground, and listen to the elves sing, and have nice food, and drink, and all that sort of stuff. Um, so this was our first use of one of the kind of three special modes in the One Ring 2nd Edition. Um, they're the same as in One Ring 1st Edition. There's Council, Combat, and Journeys. And they are sort of separate kind of mini-games that are um, within the structure of the adventuring phase. So the adventuring phase is the time when the player characters go on adventures, and then there's the fellowship phase where they basically recover from their adventures. Um, in the adventuring phase, you can have sort of free-form gameplay, which is what we had been doing, and then you can have these sort of mini-games almost that sort of structure the adventure a little more. So this was a council. Um, Hallis the Elf was able to roll really well on his introduction, so he got them, uh, basically mechanically what that does is it gets you more chances to roll before the uh, council is over, which means that you get um, better odds of getting the number of successes that you need to totally succeed. So in this case, they had six rolls available and they only needed three successes. Um, because Hallis the Elf did such a good introduction. Um, so we sort of role-played that out. What, what I like to do is sort of a combination of talky-talky and rolling. And often what I like to do is have the player characters sort of state what they're trying to do, roll, and then um, 
talk through what the role means essentially so the the player character will say like well i want to introduce the party and i want to do it in this way and i say okay that sounds like a uh, a courtesy check for instance so why don't you roll courtesy so then we roll courtesy and we sort of talk about what the role means for what happened as opposed to a sort of more old school style where you just kind of talk through the encounter and don't roll any dice or only roll a reaction roll or something like that um so anyway, Halas the Elf made a great introduction, and then each of the other player characters did one, succeeded at one um, talk role, essentially. So uh, Freren the Dwarf is a scholar, so he's got a great lore skill, so he used his lore skill to remember a sort of obscure piece of lore and um, that impressed Lindar, the the master of the sellers, about the the kind of relationship between the elves and the dwarves. Um, Bungo the Hobbit had a really great courtesy skill, so he was able to sort of use his courtesy to um, impress Lindar. He kind of bowed and um, talked about the hospitality of hobbits and of elves and how important that was for bringing people together. And then Wilder the Ranger, who is a little bit of a funny character, he's um, sort of always on guard against the shadow. Um, he basically... Uh, gave a little bit of a discuss a speech about how um, we all have to be, you know, in these dark times, we all have to work together to face the shadow. And it was a little uh, off in the sense that Lindar, the elf, what I decided was he wasn't quite sure how that applied. So I assessed a die penalty, which is how you modify roles in the One Ring Second Edition. Um, the player thought that was just fine. He said that was totally appropriate. And, um, but he spent some hope to get the die back, basically. Um, and so Rold got his success, and so I decided, okay, so Lindar wasn't quite sure how that applied, but he's definitely impressed by the, the character's character, essentially. Um, and so from there, uh, they, they had gotten their three successes, so I said, all right, um, Lindar, the, the master of the sellers, the elf, he's going to say, okay, I understand, I was wrong. What I'm going to do is um, bring you guys upstairs. You'll have nice rooms. You'll get, you know, good elven bread and wine and all that sort of stuff. And you may even be able to hear the elves singing in the starlight um, and all that sort of stuff. So they spent about two days in the Elf King's Halls just hanging out in, in the nice rooms, sort of walking around and seeing things. They didn't really, they sort of talked about wanting to do other things. Freren the Dwarf is a scholar, as I mentioned, so he was hoping to visit like a library. And I sort of said, you know, the elves are so long lived that they really have more of like an oral tradition often than kind of writing down stuff, at least among the Mirkwood elves. The, the Mirkwood elves are kind of less learned than um, like the, the high elves in Ariador, so... Um, so he wasn't able to find a library, but you know, that's okay. The players don't always need to get everything they want. Um, and I think it worked well. I think it gave a real sense of like, you know, the, the way in which lore is something really special in Middle Earth, right? That it's not just like you go to the library and find some information. It's, you know, you have to actually kind of work at recovering these, um, little fragments of what has been lost. So, anyway, um, then after about two days, Lindar and the elf steward and Baldor and Belgo, the, the merchant and his boy, come to them and say, all right, we're ready to go, and they head out, and so they go on a journey. And what I decided to do, basically the way journeys work in the One Ring 2nd Edition is a little different than the way they work in 1st Edition. Um, in second edition, the guide rolls their travel skill, and that determines basically the length of time between events, how far you're able to travel before there is an event and everybody takes a little bit of fatigue. Um, so a guide with a really good travel skill is more likely to lead the party for a longer distance than a guide with a poor travel skill who is going to have the party kind of regularly having kind of mishaps and events and all that sort of stuff. Um, so what I decided to do, there are a couple of sort of set piece events 
in the adventure as written. And what I decided to do was I would do kind of two sort of, uh, I would do a couple of sort of randomly generated events because in the normal rules for One Ring Second Edition, what you do is you roll the 12-sided feet die and one of the six-sided success dice, and that tells you what type of event is happening, what's at stake, and then the six-sided success dice tells you um, who the event is targeting, so which player character has to deal with this event and which will suffer when um, if the event is failed, essentially. So um, what I decided was I would do one or two, depending on the rules, one or two um, kind of randomly generated ones. And then for the next events, every time, instead of rolling a random event, I just use the sort of set piece event in the book, um, which I think is a good way to do it. I think that's a good way um, because if you do all of the randomly generated events and the set piece events, that's a lot of events that happen on the journey. Um, and if you don't do any randomly generated events, then it feels like the only thing that happens is set pieces. So I felt like that was a good balance. So um, Frere and the Dwarf is the guide. He's got a great travel skill. He rolls the first time, gets his success. They make uh, some good progress. And then we get an event. The event, what's at stake, is that the guide has to make a lore or a travel check to prevent gaining one shadow point. Uh, Frere and the Dwarf makes the roll, so I narrate how uh, Wilder, the ranger, is um, he finishes one water skin, and rather than starting a new water skin, he kind of goes to a small stream and cups his hands and is going to sort of take a sip of that water. Um, and that Frere and the dwarf comes over and sort of bats the water out of his hands and says, don't drink anything in the Mirkwood Forest. You never know what sort of shadow is upon the, the water and the food um, from hunted animals or from streams in Mirkwood. And that's good because that actually ties in to the set piece event. So I thought that was a clever way to kind of set up what eventually happens in the set piece event. Um, then the next event was for Hallis the Elf. They get a little further along their journey. Hallis the Elf has been um, has to make a check to see if he gets weary, um, or not not weary, but basically if he gets kind of worn out. He ends up getting worn out, and they have to take a day to rest on the road. They lose a day of travel, basically. Um, so it's going to take them a little longer than they thought to cover the ground because Hallis the Elf failed his role, but that's okay. We're sort of having fun doing these random events, getting into the game, and then uh, Frere and the Dwarf rolls his next travel check, and I decide, okay, this event is going to be a set piece event from the book. And so I roll randomly for how much fatigue they get for the event, um, but then what happens is that they've they've sort of made another couple days progress. It's apparently, according to the book, it's going to take them 24 days to cross Mirkwood Forest. 24 days of travel to get from the Elf King's Halls to the Forest Gate going along the Elf Path if they don't lose any time like they did with um, Hallis the Elf getting weary and needing to stop. So anyway, they've made it about halfway, maybe a little more. Um, and they find this sort of clearing on the path. Um, Belgo, the boy, kind of sits down in the clearing and says he can't go any further. He just desperately needs to rest. Um, everybody sort of looks at each other, and Baldor, the merchant, sort of pleads with the company to take a rest. And they decide, yeah, okay, we can we can take a, a sort of um, start the af start the evening a little early in the afternoon and take a rest here, get a little bit of our strength back and continue the journey in the morning. Um, so they set up camp here. There's a sort of stream running by um, and they um, have a nice meal. They sort of set a watch. So I roll randomly for who is on watch and it's Bungo the Hobbit on the last watch of the night. So it's sort of creeping up towards morning. It's probably, you know, like four, maybe even five in the morning. Um, probably more like four in the morning because it's it's kind of mid-spring. Um, still dark. Bungo is having trouble keeping his eyes open. He's just totally worn out from the journey too. Um, he's sort of having trouble and I have him roll an awareness check and he fails. So that awareness check was to um, notice that uh, Baldor the merchant has kind of 
uh, woken up and has sort of stood up and walks over towards the stream. Um, Bungo gets to roll another awareness check, which means that he notices that Baldor, he notices too late that Baldor, who is thirsty and has apparently forgotten the dwarf's warning, cups his hands um, in the crystal clear water of the stream and takes a sip of the water from the Mirkwood Forest. Bungo calls out, shouts at him not to do that, but only too late, and Baldor drinks the water. Baldor turns at the noise of the shout. He seems to have the light of recognition in his eyes, but it fades almost instantly. And he begins to shout. He's shouting about being kidnapped and how the dragon is attacking and he has to save his wife and son. Um, what the party character, what the player characters may not kind of be able to tell is that Baldor has been basically transported back to four years ago, the night of the dragon attack. He's sort of lost his memory of the intervening time. So he's totally disoriented, doesn't know where he is. He um, doesn't know who any of these people are, is kind of completely out of it. Um, Wilder the ranger succeeds at an awareness roll, so he wakes up at the sound of Bungo's shout. So does Hallis the elf. Frere and the dwarf is feeling a little more groggy. He doesn't quite make it um, awake in time. So... Baldor the merchant being shouted at and thinking that he has been kidnapped rushes off into the forest and they know don't leave the path that's sort of the big thing in Mirkwood is don't leave the path Wilder the ranger rushes after him immediately makes his athletic check so he's able to keep pace with Baldor the merchant as Baldor is sort of crashing through the forest. Hallis the elf goes after them but he fails his athletic check so he's a little bit slower and then Freren the dwarf is finally kind of waking himself up and rushes after them, um, grabs his axe and rushes out after them so he's going to be third in line. Bungo the hobbit decides he's got the shortest legs and he's got a not very good athletic score so he's going to have trouble keeping up with all of them so what he's going to do is he's going to keep watch on the campsite he's going to make sure that Belgo is okay the boy because the boy is like a nine-year-old and as Bungo very rightly points out it's uh it would be a pretty terrible thing to leave a nine-year-old alone in this haunted forest um so Bungo the Hobbit is going to stay in camp so what happens is they race after um, the three of uh, the elf, the dwarf, and the ranger are racing after Baldor the merchant. Baldor trips and falls into a kind of collection of spider webs and sort of rolls through them. He's not like cocooned up completely, but he is, you know, wrapped up in spider webs and struggling to get free as Wilder races up after him. Wilder goes and sort of realizes what is about to happen, throws down his bow, draws his sword and pulls out his buckler and stands over Baldor the merchant because he realizes that there are gonna be spiders coming. One spider appears at the beginning of the round, but so does Hallis the Elf, who was racing after him. Hallis the Elf charges forward, stabs the spider in the eye and kills it with an excellent roll with swords. Um, kills it in a single blow. Uh, this adder cop, which is a big kind of like, um, not like a shelob sized spider, but a, a much bigger than a regular spider spider, right? We're talking about something kind of like big dog or wolf sized. Um, next round, two more adder cops appear, but so does Freren the dwarf. Uh, Hallis the elf pulls back, sheaths his sword, pulls out his bow. Freyr and the dwarf sort of charges forward to form the shield wall with Wilder the ranger. The adder cops surge forward. They're able to kill some adder cops. But what happens, what is happening, so in the book, this encounter plays out a little differently. But what I did was I decided that because in the book, what happens is that Baldor the merchant is um, captured by the spiders, taken to their lair, and as the heroes fight the spiders while trying to rescue Baldor the merchant, every round, the round number of spiders appear. 
I decided that because the heroes had been so good about not letting Baldor get away, that the spiders, it, it would be unfair for the spiders to just capture Baldor and take him. So what would happen was that the spiders um, would start appearing, but only two of them each round as the maximum. So in the fourth round, instead of four spiders, two spiders would appear. Still very dangerous because these spiders, these spiders have 14 endurance each, so they um, are hard to take down in a single blow. Oh, excuse me. So they're they're not um, nothing to sniff at. They're um, they're serious opponents, and it turns out that there are no spiders in the One Ring Second Edition book as of yet because there are not as many spiders in Ariador as there are in the Mirkwood region. So what I did was I opened up my One Ring First Edition book and sort of talked to the players about what I was doing and said like, okay, so I'm going to have to kind of make an enemy on the fly, but I think we can use most of the stats from the One Ring First Edition pretty much as written with a little bit of tinkering to reflect some of the changes that have happened between first and second edition, but um, I think the result worked really well. Um, the spiders felt menacing, but they were not overpowered or really underpowered at all. They were a serious threat, but um, yeah, a, a really, a really serious threat that um, the players had to deal with. So the players are fighting the spiders and they're starting to get overwhelmed. They've killed, in the course of the fight, they get to the point where there are five spiders fighting them and four that they have killed. So nine spiders total um, because one round of one spider at the beginning and then a couple rounds of two spiders every round after. They've killed off a number of these spiders. They're fighting, they're desperate. They're realizing that they're in trouble. Wilder the ranger comes up with the idea that what he's gonna do instead of attacking a spider is he's gonna use his sword to try to cut Baldor the merchant free of the webs so that Baldor can escape so that they can just run away. He does so. Baldor the merchant is up and he starts to run. He's not going very fast, but they think that they're gonna be okay. So the way escaping works is in the One Ring second edition is that if you're in rearward stance, meaning that you're sort of behind the front line shooting your bow, you can just flee at any time. If you are not in rearward stance, you have to make a combat proficiency check. And if you succeed, you create an opening. Basically, rather than hitting an enemy, you create an opening to flee and are able to flee. So we're in sort of the first round of attempted fleeing. Wilder the Ranger rolls does not succeed. So Frere and the Dwarf says, well, I'm not gonna run if Wild, I can tell Wilder's not running, I'm not gonna run, so I'm just gonna attack a spider, attacks a spider, Hallis the Elf finishes off the spider with his bow, we're down to four spiders on the two frontline heroes, plus Hallis the Elf behind them. And they're fighting, they're getting in serious trouble though. Wilder the Ranger has a parry of 20 with his reinforced buckler. So he's really hard to hit, but he does take a piercing blow at one point when I roll an Eye of Sauron. And that is deadly because he doesn't have very good armor. So he takes a wound. So he like actually gets bit by one of these spiders and there's poison in him or, or venom, whichever it is for spiders. Um, so he is taking a wound. So he's in serious trouble. If he takes another wound, he dies, right? Um, or if he goes down to uh, zero endurance, he'll be dying. So Frere and the Dwarf has really good armor, but he's getting hit regularly because his parry is only 14. It actually should be 16 with his shield, but um, the player forgot his shield bonus and um, we were too far along to go back. Um, so Frere and the Dwarf has taken a lot of endurance loss. He at one point pushes his helmet off of his head, drops his shield and two hands his long hafted ax so that he can um, keep fighting because he is getting weary. So he, he tosses off his helmet and tosses down his shield to lower his load so that he can continue fighting um, without being weary. Um, next round, Wilder the Ranger succeeds at his role to create an opening, but Frere and the Dwarf 
fails. Wilder the Ranger says, can I see what's going on? And I say, yeah, you can tell Freren has not been able to create an opening. So Wilder says, okay, I'm sticking around. I'm not going to leave him behind. Hallis the Elf is still firing arrows into the melee, very deadly with his bow. But then on the enemy's turn that round, Freren the Dwarf goes down. He hits zero endurance and is knocked unconscious. One of the spiders is still active, so it bites at him, tries trying to wound him through the armor while he's basically in that kind of so weary he can't even fight half-conscious state, just trying to stay alive. So we're, we're in trouble now because Freren is technically unconscious, so he can't run. So we sort of talk through it and we sort of say, okay, what could we do to save Freren? How are we going to save this character? And I say, okay, well, you know, if you create an opening and make like an athletics check, maybe a great success on an athletics check, probably a great success, you might be able to grab Freren and kind of carry him out from the fight. You might take some attacks while it happens, all that sort of stuff. Hallis the Elf says, I as an elf, have the elf skill cultural blessing, which means that I can spend a point of hope and get a magical success on a roll. Magical success is a new thing in One Ring 2nd Edition. It basically represents something sort of supernaturally effective. And the elf can just spend a point of hope and do it on any skill roll. Now, the elf doesn't heal hope nearly as quickly as the other characters. So it's a little bit of a dicey situation for the elf to be elf to be spending too much hope. And Freren, the dwarf, is the elf's fellowship focus, his buddy. So we decide, okay, here's what we're going to do. Wilder the Ranger rolls his combat proficiency. He's weary. He's down to, I don't remember how much endurance, maybe like 14, maybe less. So he's totally, he's weary. He's um, ha he's having trouble. He spends his point of hope to get two extra dice on the roll because he's swift. He rolls his four success dice. Three of them count as weary, but the one that comes up regular is a six, and he gets an eight on his... Um, feet die, which means that he succeeds at the target number of 14 check. And he does so with a great success even. So he turns, he realizes Freren is down, he doesn't know what to do, so he turns and runs off into the forest after sort of creating an opening with his sword. Hallis the Elf is not going to leave his buddy behind. He spends his point of hope to roll athletics, rolls athletics, gets a, and he spends his point of hope to get a magical success on athletics and then rolls athletics. What I say is if you get a great success on your athletics check, essentially, if you roll a six on one of your six-headed dice, Freren the dwarf won't even have to make a wound check. Otherwise, he's going to have to make another armor save because the spiders are sort of biting at him while he's on the ground. Um, doesn't get the six. So Hallis the elf rushes into the fray, bow in one hand, does this sort of awesome rolling move where he rolls over Freren's body and comes up with Freren's body, kind of fireman's carry across his shoulders, runs off into the forest in the direction of the path. Freren um, asks if he can be the sort of canny dwarf who has a leather strap for his axe so that he doesn't leave it behind. And I say, yeah, that's fine. Your helm and your shield are lost because you dropped them, um, but the axe will still be um, on your character sheet essentially because you'll have like a leather strap so you don't lose it. Um, that seems totally fair to me because he's a, he's a dwarf, so he knows how to use axes, all that sort of stuff. Hallis the Elf runs back through the forest after Wilder carrying unconscious Freren. And we don't know if Freren is wounded yet. So, Bungo, Bungo the Hobbit has calmed down Belgo the boy, has kept watch on the ponies. Wilder the Ranger comes rushing out of the woods and sort of comes and collapses down. He's totally weary. He's worn out. And you can see a spot where one of the spiders is like bit into him. And there's like poison marks on his veins, right? That, that sort of like horrible blackish marks around the veins. Um, just after him comes Hallis the Elf carrying Freren the Dwarf. 
Hallis comes over and lays Freren down gently, and I say, okay, Freren, you gotta make a armor save, a protection roll, because um, those spiders were biting at you while you were on the ground. So if you fail this, you're gonna be wounded in addition to at zero endurance. Freren makes the roll. He's got really good armor. He's he's a dwarf, so he gets a bonus for wearing really heavy armor. Basically, it, it costs him less endurance to wear heavy armor, so he wears very heavy armor. Um, he makes the roll. So I say, okay, Freren, your armor held while you were on the ground, barely conscious, and you are not even wounded. You're gonna take a little while to recover because you're at zero endurance, so technically you need a full long, a full night's rest to recover endurance. So they're gonna to have to stay in the camp another night, basically. But they're back at the elf path. They can see the glowing eyes of the spiders out in the woods, but something about the magic of this ancient elf path is keeping the spiders at bay and they are gonna be safe. Hallis the elf goes over to Wilder the ranger and performs a healing on him to reduce the amount of time that the injury is going to linger. Wilder is not going to recover. Because Wilder is wounded, he's not going to recover as much endurance on a night's rest. But after a couple days, that wound is going to heal up and he's going to be okay and he's going to recover back all of his endurance. So he's going to get... He's going to be okay too. And that's a, a big difference between one ring, first edition and second edition. In first edition, you basically couldn't recover endurance on the road at all, which meant that if you got into a fight early on in a travel um, journey, you basically had to quit the journey because otherwise you just die out in the wilderness um, because you just don't have any endurance. So at least that's the way I remember it. It might be that there's like a rule for recovering a little bit of endurance, um, but not much. You can't recover very much endurance in One Ring First Edition. I think you can recover a little bit, but I think I think it's only like one recovery after, not one point, but one like heart's rating worth of recovery after each combat um, or something like that. So it's not very much. You get a lot more endurance recovery in Second Edition, which is nice. So they're back in the camp. Baldor ran off and he um, appeared in the camp just before Wilder the Ranger because um, he was the first to leave the sort of fight scene. He's still sort of out of it, but he recognized that these guys saved his life, so he's going to trust them for now. He doesn't know them anymore, so he's, he's pretty out of it. And in particular, he doesn't really have the same relationship with his son Belgo because he thinks Belgo is a five-year-old, not a nine-year-old. Um, right, because his mind has been taken back four years. So there's going to be a bit of estrangement. Bungo the Hobbit decides that he's going to bust out. He's got a special liquor that um, is enheartening. So he busts out the special, you know, um, special brandy or, or whiskey or whatever it is. I don't remember what he said. Um, and, you know, uh, gives everybody a sip from the flask. And I say, okay, there's no mechanical benefit for that normally, but what I'll do is I'll give you back a fellowship point so that somebody else can recover a point of hope, basically, from that um, action. Because that seems, you know, that's great. That's super flavorful. That seems like the sort of thing that heroes do is they, they try to, you know, enhearten each other when they're down and all that sort of stuff. And I really liked that, um, that Bungo's character kind of sprung up with that idea because he hadn't been in the fight and he wanted to, you know, make sure that his buddies were okay. Hallis the Elf is just fine. He shot some arrows, but we don't keep track of ammunition in the One Ring 2nd Edition, so he's, he's just fine. Wilder the Ranger is wounded and down some endurance. He's going to be okay in a couple days, but he's not really going to be at fighting fit for that amount of time. Freren the Dwarf at zero endurance, it's going to take him basically a full eight hours rest to recover his endurance. He's not wounded, so he's going to recover all of it as far as I know from what I read of the rules. I need to double check the rules to make sure that's how it works. But he's not wounded, so I think he's going to recover all of his endurance and be basically back good as new. He just sort of got beat up and needs a, a good night's sleep to recover his energy um, he's going to have a couple bruises and all that sort of stuff, but we end the session with sort of dawn that morning coming. 
not quite sure what we're going to do next. Are they going to stay in the camp? Are they going to try to put Farron on a pony and get out of there? Are they going to... Um, basically, those are sort of the obvious two options, but there's some other ones that they could come up with. Um, but it was awesome. It was such a good session. The players were, like I said, they were engaged. They were interrogating the fiction. They were having a lot of fun. I got a bunch of messages on Discord after the session of them talking about how much fun they had, which was great. It was so cool to get um, get messages from the players saying like, yeah, that was such a blast. Um, and I had an absolute blast. I was so worried that I was going to kill one of the player characters in the first combat of the campaign. But we figured out a way to, without like GM Fiat, right? Because it's in the rules, right? The magical success rules basically say you do something magical. Um, so it wasn't, I feel like it wasn't just GM Fiat to kind of like make it okay. It was, you know, the players using their resources efficiently and using their special abilities efficiently to, um, to save the day. So, um, yeah, it was awesome. It was so good. It was such a fun session. The One Ring Second Edition, I think, is a really great system. I really loved First Edition, and I like Second Edition maybe even more. I'm going to have to run it a little more to make sure that I feel that way, but I, I my suspicion is that I'm going to love Second Edition One Ring even more than I loved First Edition One Ring, um, and it's, it's just so much fun. It's so flavorful. It feels like something straight out of one of the professor's stories, um, or at least that it belongs in that world in a way that like a lot of kind of more D&D-ish games I think don't really, you know, games where there's fireballs being cast by fourth level wizards, that's not really what, um, and, and lots of dungeon delves and all that sort of stuff. To me, that's not really what Tolkien stories are, are like, that they're about, they're thematically and, and um, kind of structurally built the way that the one ring is built and that is really cool and so i i just adore the one ring for telling these sorts of stories um and it was an absolute blast it was such a fun session to play with the guys like i said the players were all really really top tier they were all super engaged they were looking up rules um on their off turns to make sure that they were doing things correctly they were um engaging with the fiction is, is sort of the biggest thing that they were really working at kind of like you know being heroic characters in the fiction and and trying to engage with it and and you know do appropriate things and behave the way that Tolkien heroes behave and all that sort of stuff and that was so cool it was it was so good so I owe a huge debt of gratitude to the players um, because you know a great session is not just on the game master's shoulders it is absolutely also on the players shoulders as well and having it was a great session, like capital G great. It was so much fun and it was, um, yeah, just, just a really excellent session of role playing. So anyway, next Saturday we are going to play the second half of that adventure from the book and probably a little more than that. There's sort of a, a suggested epilogue that I will probably use. So I think we're gonna finish that kind of first adventure in two sessions. Seems like two to three sessions is probably standard for each of the seven adventures. So you're probably looking at between you know, 14 and 21, so call it 16 or 17 sessions to run through the whole Tales of the Wilderland book. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to do all of that. What we had talked about doing was playing, um, you know, four or five sessions and then kind of reevaluating. So we may end up doing that if we're having fun. And I think everybody had a ton of fun. Everybody said they had a lot of fun, and I certainly had a lot of fun. Um, if we're having fun with it, we may well just play through the whole Tales of the Wilder Land adventure path, essentially, um, because that would be a ton of fun. So I think, um, yeah, it was great. It was it was a super fun session, really, really great role playing all around and an intense combat that was really almost deadly to one or more of the player characters. I mean, for instance, if 
if Wilder had taken another wound, that would have been it, and he would have been dying. And Hallis could only save one of them, right? Um, so it was very close to losing a player character or even two in the very first combat, in the very first session of the campaign. I'm so glad that nobody died and that we get to keep playing with these characters because the players put so much work into making these characters their own and having really great personalities and all that sort of stuff. So anyway... It was really, really fun, and that's sort of the end of my discussion about that. Um, if you back to the Kickstarter for the One Ring Second Edition, I recommend that you download the Alpha Rules because while they're not kind of complete and finished and all that sort of stuff, they're definitely in a playable state, um, and they're super fun to play. Otherwise, um, hopefully... Free League will uh, release the final version of the rules pretty soon because um, I think everybody who didn't back the Kickstarter is hoping to get their hands on it. Um, and I would love for more people to get a chance to play this game because it's so good. Anyway, I'm going to leave you guys on the One Ring 2nd Edition art. Could easily be our party with that um, the man with the long sword, the elf with the bow, the dwarf with the big long hafted axe, and the hobbit on there um yeah one ring second edition it was so good i'm gonna leave you guys with that i've been arlen walker i've been live from pelham's wasteland and i will see you next time take care everybody <laughs>